We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrovix. Joining me today is the little green chicken again, Doomberg, and the head writer for the Doomberg team. How are you today? Tom, doing fantastic. Great to be back. Always love uh, coming on your show. And, uh, you know, it, it never seems to be a shortage of interesting things for us to discuss when when we do come on. And so looking forward to another session today. Absolutely. And I, I'm always grateful to be able to talk to you because, you know, one of the one of the themes that I think that we really need to think about nowadays is the idea of trade-offs. And I think that is is going to be an idea that really underlines and runs through a lot of the different scenarios and and ideas that we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, of course, the last time you and I spoke was within a day of the Nord Stream pipeline attacks. And, and you recently released an article titled, Let's See More, in which you go through the set of accusations by Seymour Hirsch in his debut on Substack, where he points the finger at America as the responsible party that took out the pipelines. So what do you think are the important points there to consider about this situation now? Yeah, as you say, when we last um, got together, it was at the peak uh, of interest around the pipelines. They had recently been sabotaged, and and you and I were very careful to not um, lay blame uh, on any particular party. And and in fact, I, I could tell you that, that we wrote a piece um, about that. I believe it was called um, "Decades and Minutes" or something very close to that. And the fact that we um, didn't immediately toe the line and blame uh, Vladimir Putin for blowing up his own pipeline generated a fair bit of negative feedback from mm -hmm. what I would say sort of partisans and or trolls. Um, and and we were both careful to say a very fascinating thing that just occurred, a very consequential thing that just occurred. And uh, even with this piece here that we titled Let's See More, which sort of a, a play of words on on Seymour's first name, Seymour Hersh's first name. And and you know we opened the piece by saying back when the media establishment was against war and distrusted the the US intelligence apparatus, Seymour Hersh was, you know, considered to be a a top tier investigative journalist and and we find the reaction to this piece which in large swaths of the media to be complete silence uh and then in other parts of the media to be sort of um this guy's a crank and a conspiracy theorist all of a sudden after 50 years as a professional investigative reporter um it's been very fascinating to watch and our piece actually wasn't about the Nord Stream pipelines per se mm -hmm. um although that is a deeply interesting and deeply troubling set of accusations if true it was more uh, a piece about the state of journalism and and the fact that, for example, Seymour Hirsch used one anonymous source, which is curious and weak, as some would say, you know, from a professional journalism perspective, we like to say we at Doomberg are not professional journalists, but we try to be professional in our journalism. Um, and uh, but there are examples of where you can go with the piece. Uh, we quoted the Associated Press's policies uh, in that regard. But the complete silence of the traditional media, the fact that he chose Substack to publish this really stunning set of accusations um it was really very interesting to us and uh and you know we shall see he has promised um a, sig a significant number of follow-up pieces we of course subscribe to a Substack um immediately because he is a, a as I, I got into a bit of a tussle with somebody in the media via dm and i said to this person um it is undeniably newsworthy that seymour hirsch of all people wrote that piece and um, and I think it's fair game for us and others to comment on whether his accusations um, hold any merit. And as we said in the piece, if it turns out that he got this reporting wrong, um, that really is going to be extraordinarily damaging to his legacy and deservedly so. This is mm -hmm. not the not the type of accusations that one makes um, lightly. So, yeah, really fascinating to see that drop on Substack. Interested to see a lack of response by and large by the media. Very curious to see. What Seymour Hirsch says uh, on a go forward basis as he continues to, to to gather string on the story, as as they would say. Mm -hmm. You know, one important point I think is worth mentioning there, and I think you guys do a great job of it. I know I try to really stay neutral and just kind of let the facts present themselves as as they do. But you know, the idea that you mentioned about being attacked for you know not immediately pointing the finger at Putin or Russia. When we talk about ideas surrounding Russia on this show, we we always get the accusation of being Putin apologists or something to that effect. And 
you know, I try to not take a side one way or another and look at the facts, you know, hopefully as objectively as we can. Do you find that it that there is a a large portion of the public out there that that accuses you of the same thing of being an apologist for for Putin? Absolutely. Um, and as we said in the piece, I'm old enough to remember when being anti-war was considered sort of a left-leaning, um, slightly unpatriotic position to hold, and now it's mm -hmm. somehow morphed into an alt-right pro-Putin position. Um, let me be very clear. Uh, we are against war at Doomberg. Uh, we are for peace. We are not naive to assume that occasionally um, people of good moral standing need to confront people of lesser moral standing. And and we have um, we were surprised when Putin invaded Ukraine. We condemn it. Um, we we didn't imagine that he could be so foolish. I think the the uh, the, the quandary that he finds himself in, and he has put his country in, and and sort of isolated Russia from the rest of the of the Western world has has done significant damage. Um, he obviously feels very motivated by his own set of principles uh, to do what he has done. Mm -hmm. um, I we are of course of the camp that you should try to. Um, to understand what's going on and and by the way as we said in the seymour first piece let's see more um you know he russia for whatever you think of them are a a nuclear power and um being the parent of of draft eligible children i i would like at least for my congressman to vote on whether we should go to war with a nuclear power um and uh, as we said in the piece if if we blew up if we the united states i'm a citizen of the united states if the united states blew up a decabillion dollar energy infrastructure project jointly owned by an ally and an adversary, it's hard to imagine a more overt act of war than that, given the criticality of energy and mm -hmm. energy is life and the lack of energy is death. Um, and so if Biden did that and purposely hid it from Congress in the way that Seymour Hirsch reported, and I should say the word if is doing an enormous amount of heavy lifting in what I'm about to say, mm -hmm. but if the facts as reported by Simo Hirsch largely turn out to be true, that seems to us to be an impeachable offense. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you know, you, you don't effectively go to war with a global nuclear power without the consent of Congress. It's not how the constitution um, is designed to operate and, and think of the precedent it sets. So again, we always like, we've only ever written Doomberg when Joe Biden has been president. Mm -hmm. And so because we are, tend to be somewhat critical people and, and the, the masthead is called Doomberg, we have written critically about Joe Biden. Um, let's not confuse ourselves. If there was a Republican president or if we had started Doomberg when Donald Trump was president, we would have been just as critical if we felt it was worthy of, of Donald Trump. Um, and by the way, if Donald Trump was doing this, you can imagine how the media might be treating this situation differently. And I know that's sort of a bit of a, you know, uh, sort of a lazy man's way to look at things, but it is just undeniable that I, I, I strongly believe that the media would be treating the situation vastly differently if, quote, reckless Donald Trump was um, bombing, um, you know, the energy infrastructure of nuclear powers with reckless abandon and without the consent of Congress. There would be howls. And, and the absence of those howls is fascinating to me. And, um, you know, when, when, if and when the Republicans retake the White House, people will see that we will be critical of, of the policies where we feel like those policies deserve critique. And the final proof is, is we have praised, for example, um, Governor Gavin Newsom's approach to nuclear power in Diablo Canyon when we felt it was worthy of it. And that annoyed several of our subscribers who might be on the, on the political right. But he is deserving of that praise. He, mm -hmm. he spent political capital to save Diablo Canyon. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, Donald Trump was 100 percent right when he when he warned the Germans about their dependency on, on Russian natural gas. And they laughed at him at the United Nations. And I could say from here, both Donald Trump and Gavin Newsom were correct. And by doing so, I'll probably alienate you know 95 percent of the public because the, the purity uh, of your analysis is, is, is all too often how people measure you. Mm -hmm. Well, <sighs> I, I'd like to get to the the Diablo Canyon story, um, but the one the one thing I wanted to touch on before we maybe leave the pipeline story was why do you think that the the media has been you know quite silent on this? Why why do you think that there are no 
noises being made about, you know, Biden possibly being impeached for that? I, I honestly don't know. Um, and when I don't know, I like to clarify that I'm speculating. I think if I were to speculate, um, it's partially a team sport thing. I, I honestly, I, I do believe that um, the majority of people who work at traditional um, mainstream media type organizations tend to lean left. And far too much of the American culture has dissolved into uh, a team sport mindset. And so if it's our team that did it, it, it must be good. And if it's our team that did it, it can't be bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and vice versa, by the way, this is, you know, a pox on both, on both parties. Um, there was lots of behavior that Donald Trump exhibited when he was president, that if we were writing Newberg at the time, we would have been highly critical of. And it doesn't do the conservative side of the aisle any good to gloss over that behavior or to excuse it simply because, you know, Donald Trump is on your team and or the ends justify the means. <laughs> uh, or Nor does it matter that um, if the opposing party was doing it, the press would cover it up for them. Like mm-hmm. you have a set of principles or you don't. So I would characterize ourselves as um, ideologues, not partisans. You know, we have a set of core beliefs and 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 we will write to those beliefs and we, we are not partisans. We don't want to sign up for the team sport exercise. So part of it is team sport. Part of it is um, access journalism, I guess, is lack of a better word. Like you, if you run stories critical of the party in power, you lose potential access to sources. You could be blacklisted from such sources. Um, and then I just think, honestly, when you're swimming in that pool, it's hard to know that you're in the water. And I just think that many in the media have convinced themselves that Seymour Hirsch is a washed up old crank and that Substack is not a serious place for journalism. And so the fact that Seymour Hirsch published it on Substack means they can and should ignore it, that it is a priori disinformation until proven otherwise. It's not given the benefit of any doubt whatsoever. And they just, wave their hands and move on to the next, you know, clickbait news cycle of the day. It's interesting that you bring up the idea of, let's say, alienating 95% of the, of the listeners, let's say by, you know, making whatever statement that you're, that you're going to. And also the idea that you have these certain principles that you try to abide by. I was listening to a podcast yesterday with Chris Best, the CEO of Substack. And he talks about the idea that you know, this has become a place for journalists to redo journalism, to to get back to, you know, investigating the things that journalists should be investigating. So why do you think that we've needed Substack really to be the place where journalists can revisit the idea of, of doing actual journalism? So it's, it's a great question. And given the prominent importance of Substack, to um, our enterprise. It's one that, as you can imagine, we had given a significant amount of thought to and um, love Chris best, love the team at Substack. The problem statement, few would disagree with. The current modern form of journalism is broken in the United States, um, ruined predominantly by um, Google and Facebook, um, making it almost impossible for independent newspapers to generate sufficient revenue to pay a livable wage to professional reporters. Um, They stole money basically from the traditional news media. And as a consequence of that and the rise of the sensationalism of Fox News and then after that MSNBC on the other side, um, so the the, the clickbait journalism exploded. And what you found was the, the people who remained behind in the traditional news outlets felt this enormous pressure to, uh, to somehow justify their existence as opposed to just the fact that as a societal good, good, fair, effective investigative journalism is needed for the proper functioning of a democracy. Uh, But that old model is completely thoroughly and I believe irreparably broken. The next question then becomes what to do about it. And Substack is an attempt by Chris Bess and team to develop an alternative. Now, Substack has its challenges. the the main critique against Substack from those in the traditional media is the lack of content moderation, which in the eyes of some is its key strength and in the eyes of others is its crippling weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, we we try hard to um, keep an eye on our comments and to be professional in our journalism. Again, um, but you can create a lot of eyeballs by developing 
um, sorry, provably untrue things and putting them on Substack, and Substack won't interfere with that. And and that offense in the minds of those of the old guard um, makes is sort of a disqualifying offense in their eyes, which means they can loop in Doomberg with whatever loopy thing somebody has happened to be publishing on Substack that Substack is not intervening on and not labeling as misinformation or, or removing it from its platform. Um, so it is all of those things. It is a safe harbor for professional journalists to do their jobs. It is a wonderful place for people who wish to entertain their readers to do so and to create a living doing it. We've carved out a wonderful living on, on Substack in the past two years. It's been utterly life altering for us. And we are incredibly grateful to our many subscribers for giving us the opportunity to do this for a living for as long as we'll be able to. Um, and, and we shall see, I, I can tell you that the hatred for Substack in the traditional media is palpable. Um, and if that's an indicator of success, then Chris and team, Hamish and team, uh, uh, and our, our favorite Linda uh, and team over there at Substack are doing a really amazing job. Uh, but it also makes them a target. And so we shall see. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity for us, but also it's a risk. So, for example, imagine Seymour Hersh's article turns out to be false. Mm -hmm. That is a significant stain on the Substack brand. And for us personally, we've co-branded Doomberg with Substack. And so um, as a citizen and as a patriot and as a parent of draft eligible children, I hope Seymour Hersh's reporting is wrong. Mm -hmm. I do not want to live in a world where a sitting U.S. president feels emboldened to destroy a decabillion dollar energy project of an ally and an adversary and works knowingly and purposefully to cover up his participation in that, what I think is blatantly illegal activity from Congress. I don't want to live in that world. Mm -hmm. um, but if it turns out that Hirsch's reporting is wrong, that's going to be a significant issue for our business because we are on Substack. It's Doomberg Substack. <clears throat> you know, it's not, it's not just Doomberg. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be a significant stain and it would give a lot of ammunition to the people that don't like Substack to try to force uh, changes on the platform that would really destroy the essence of what makes it great. Yeah, it just like you say, the the idea that that Substack, you know, riles so much hatred within the establishment probably points to the fact that they are being, you know, threatened by that. And, and and more than that, it means there's a vast swath of the country that feels as though it is not properly serviced by the existing media infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And Substack is the best hope they've seen to read things that they find compelling, truthful, interesting, or feed their own biases. You know, that, that's all part of human nature. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I think Substack's model of a very, very light touch with content moderation um, is what makes it great. It also is what makes it um, risky. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly hope they succeed. And we've done the best we can to help the platform and to co-brand with them and to, um, you know, to, to color within the lines, as you might say, and, and not go, um, uh, you know, uh, give our credit, our many critics an opportunity to make a solid case against us. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, you know, right or wrong, some of the, the content creators on there being right or wrong, at least it's a place where people can share and oppose ideas rather than only hearing one side of the story. Um, yeah, well, 100%. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to get back to kind of the idea of pipelines and the idea behind trade-offs. So, you know, thinking about the safety profile of pipelines versus, let's say, rail, is, is the idea that pipelines are detrimental to the environment and must be opposed at all costs, misled at best, or should we take a step back and look at the bigger picture and consider these trade-offs again. And I know we can use the example of shipping things by rail and its safety profile. Yeah, so at its core, the professional environmental movement's opposition to pipelines is nothing more than a manifestation of their opposition to the development of fossil fuels, period. And it is undeniable that in the following order, um, safety and, and environmental efficiency and economic efficiency goes as follows. Pipelines are way safer than rail, which is way safer than truck. And so the opposition to the development of pipelines in the United States and Canada and Western Europe, for example, um, is born out of a broader sort of 
primary desire to oppose all fossil fuel development whatsoever. And it's very disingenuous because those fossil fuels will eventually get to the market anyway. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, secretly, many of them hope that they see a train derailment or a truck explosion um, because of an absence of a pipeline, because then they could shut down the whole enterprise altogether. Um, and and there have been substantial train derailments uh, of, of you know tankers carrying oil in towns where people have died because of the explosion. So several dozen people died in a famous derailment in Quebec, for example, um, several years ago, early early parts of the 2010s, I believe it was. Um, and so um, the, the, let's be very clear about what's going on. People that oppose pipelines oppose fossil fuels. And so this is just um, attacking the most beneficial aspect of, say, natural gas or oil is that you can transport it long distances extraordinarily safely, extraordinarily cheaply, and, and unlock the benefits of such an energy bounty for society. And if those benefits were ultimately realized, then their opposition to fossil fuels would be more difficult to make. That's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to with pipelines. And as we saw with the, the train derailment in East Palestine, which we've written about, and I'm sure we'll get into, um, no mode of transportation is not without its risk. The occasional pipeline does burst, um, et cetera, et cetera. The Exxon Valdez and Alaska, you know, um, there are only trade-offs in life, as you mentioned. It's something we have driven home in a lot of our writing. There are no solutions, only trade-offs. And so for each of the available options, you must do a cost-benefit analysis. And if you proactively ignore all the benefits of fossil fuels and only focus on the costs and then turn around and only focus on the benefits of renewable energy and don't focus on any of the costs, then um, you are basically manipulating and you're a propagandist. And, and it's unfortunate, but the progressive political environmental movement have become extraordinarily skilled at propaganda and they have, they have controlled um, the dialogue on this, uh, much to the chagrin and much to the detriment uh, of the average citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, going through and and doing some research, I, I saw a stat that there was an average of 1,704 train derailments per year. So like when we don't hear about these things, and as you say, if if these statistics are being manipulated, that's a that's a staggering statistic once you understand it but you, you know there's there's very few times that you ever hear that hear of that let's say particular statistic be presented yeah and we should be careful to say that the vast majority of those derailments um, don't involve hazardous materials and then the mm -hmm. subset of derailments that do usually don't involve a catastrophic release of hazardous materials like we've seen in east palestine um, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and so by and large, integrated over all of the statistics, shipment of hazardous materials by rail is extraordinarily safe. Our standard of living depends on us doing it. The mm -hmm. chemical industry is irreplaceable to a, you know, an irreplaceable contributor to our collective standard of living, which we all enjoy. Um, and so it's important to sort of keep your head on when you see these types of, sort of hyper hyperbolic manias erupt over what transpired in East Palestine. And, and we wrote a piece that we made free to the public called Railroaded, where, again, it's a very difficult piece to write because um, how do you try to tamp down hyperbole without looking like you are minimizing something? Because mm -hmm. to the people of East Palestine, and as we said in the piece, this is a catastrophic event for them. If we live there, we would be angry, furious, actually. We would be afraid. We would be hesitant to go back to our homes. And we would be seeking legal counsel to sue the pants off of everybody involved. And and that is a totally justifiable and fair response. But the hyperbolic uh, way in which this event both spread on social media and then really became sort of a political anvil to attack Joe Biden um, was really amazing to watch with, uh, as somebody with pretty significant experience in the area and, and, and the ability to know what this actually means and more importantly, what it doesn't mean. And and so, you know, in the piece railroaded, we just systematically went through all 24 rail cars of material that were either spilled or burned, described what they were for our readers, put some, you know, finite, tangible borders around how big of a deal this was. Um, certainly a big deal locally, certainly unacceptable, certainly a violation for the people living within a few miles of the incident, but not Chernobyl. 
and the people living along the Mississippi River probably don't need to go by bottled water, at least not because of this event. Mm -hmm. um, we have train derailments all the time. Some of them involve hazardous materials, and some of them involve significant leaks. We opened that piece by talking about a leak of vinyl chloride. A full tanker car of vinyl chloride was um, emitted into the surrounding atmosphere. 2.5 miles from Philadelphia International Airport. They didn't shut the airport that day. Tens of thousands of people flew in and flew out, totally unaware of what was going on 2.5 miles away. Um, it is a serious event for people locally. It is an indictment of both the rail industry and the chemical industry for different reasons, which we will articulate in our next piece, which is called Aftermath. Um, but it is not Chernobyl. And um, the entire eastern seaboard is, is not about to be, you know, uh, drowned in a storm of pollution because five rail cars of vinyl chloride were controllably burned. Um, let's get our heads back on. Let's learn the true lessons of this event. Let's place accountability where it's deserved. But let's not freak out to the point where we think this is the equivalent of a nuclear reactor melting down in the middle of a high density population center because it's just not and to say that it is means the next time we have a real event that is actually at the level of chernobyl a whole swath of the population will roll their eyes and say this is just hyperbole again and that's that's a dangerous thing mm -hmm. Duberg, i wanted to ask you this next question in 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 this way to get your reaction on on how you see this. So why does it seem that California leads the charge when it comes to terrible ideas of how energy is produced, used, and legislated? Well, that's a really great question. <laughs> um, the, the easiest answer that I could give is California is the land of opportunity. It's an amazingly beautiful place. It tends to have a very high concentration of highly affluent people. You know, if you've ever been to San Diego, pick any day of the year, it's going to be 70 and sunny. What a great place to live. Um, and when you have that level of affluence and you live in what is undeniably a gorgeous environment, you are afforded the luxury of assuming that such things immaculately appear and that the hard work and the energy that went into creating the situation in which you now live um, doesn't need to be replicated elsewhere. And and so um, there's a bit of um, we've made it and let's preserve things, I think, that goes on. And look, California is a deeply progressive state, and I respect those beliefs. Um, California is liberal leaning. Um, it's part of their culture. Um, Northern California is a whole different story, of course, that we're talking predominantly about the coast, but the coastal elite drive the politics in California. It's a solidly democratic state. Those are their beliefs. Um, I happen to think, we happen to think, and we happen to write, that most of the progressive thinking around energy is incorrect. Incorrect from a physics standpoint, mm -hmm. incorrect from a um, political standpoint, and deeply unfair to the vast majority of people who are still climbing the affluence ladder and for whom um, you know, achieving Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a daily struggle. And energy is life. The amount your standard of living is literally defined by how much energy you get to waste. And, and who, who do the people in California think they are to say to the rest of us that while we've climbed the mountain, you should stay at the base. Um, every human everywhere on average wants a higher standard of living. And, and, and it is, it is, it is not a, an, an ethically light thing to just say to the vast majority of the population that you're not allowed to climb the ladder that we have climbed and to live the life that we enjoy. Um, and so in many ways, it's offensive. Um, and so, you know, the, there's, a, there's a streak of Malthusianism that, that undeniably um, rolls through the professional environmental movement. I think they've tried their best to cover up that ugly history. We shouldn't let them. Um, because the policies they're arguing for today are indistinguishable from the outcomes of what Malthusians were hoping for. Um, and so, you know, it's a bit of a long answer to a, to a great question. It's one that we've thought a lot about. But broadly speaking, um, environmental progressivism, uh, progressivism is, a, is a luxury of the rich. Um, if you're in the developing world, wondering where you're going to get the next three days worth of water from, 
um, you don't really care about measuring carbon emissions. You care about getting water. And there's 8 billion of us on this planet. And each and every one of them is a human that deserves the ability to carve out a, a nice life with a decent standard of living. And um, I believe many in the environmental movement would prefer there be a lot less humans. And, and if, if that is their belief, they should just come out and say it and run on that platform. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's my answer. So you guys recently wrote a piece and talked a little bit about heat pumps. So I, I want to use this as an example of you know, as as we add complexity to energy systems, instead of using the energy closest to its source, does this make things more or less efficient? Yeah, but that was the first piece uh, we wrote this year. It's called um, "A Home Near You," where we made a prediction that heat pumps would be the the words of 2023 from the environmentalists. And boy, were we were we <laughs> right! It didn't take but a few weeks before we saw a deluge of propaganda around the. The benefits of heat pumps. Um, ultimately, we wrote about the heat pumps because they are a metaphor for an attack on um, single family homes. So secretly, or in some cases openly, environmentalists really hate the concept of a single family home. You live in the suburbs, you have you know, a four bedroom home and a backyard and a barbecue out there and two cars in your garage where you commute into work and your kids get driven to school. Um, in their eyes, that is nothing more than a volume of set of carbon emissions that need to be abated. Mm -hmm. And as we said in the piece, if, if you own a home and you own a car and you occasionally barbecue in your backyard, you are the carbon emissions they're coming after and, and don't kid yourself otherwise. And so the promotion of heat pumps is nothing more than an attack on natural gas furnaces and natural gas stoves, because again, per our conversation about the pipelines, um, they are fundamentally opposed to the exploitation of fossil fuels for the benefit of uh, increasing people's standard of living. Mm -hmm. I live in a home that is heated by natural gas, and I live in a home that is um, that the cooking fuel is natural gas. And and both are wonderful. Like it, it's a wonderful way to operate a home. Your home is your factory. The product of your factory is the health and well-being of your, your spouse and your kids. And um, natural gas is a miraculous fuel. We should be actively replacing coal with natural gas. Uh, we should be using our natural gas bounty to the maximum extent possible, including to produce polysilicon for solar panels, for example, which is something we have argued uh, in several of our pieces. Um, but the, the heat pump is a metaphor for the attack on the single family home. And uh, whenever you see somebody promoting it, what they're really doing is saying that your standard of life is something we object to. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's take the actual science of how a heat pump works adding that complexity and the the need of electricity instead of just trying to heat with natural gas does that make things less efficient than just using a natural gas furnace okay so it's a bit of a complicated question let me try to tackle it in as simple a way as possible uh, heat pumps work great in areas of the country that don't experience uh, extremely cold temperatures but as you know during a cold snap, um, how your um, HVAC system works in your home is critically important. And in fact, a dirty little secret about global warming is that far more people in the world die from exposure to cold than because of excess heat. And particularly in the populous parts of the Northeast and you know the, the, the swath of Canada that exists you know, on that sort of belt from, from Michigan to New York, uh, Ontario and Southern Quebec, heating yourself in the winter is a very big deal. And and so a heat pump is fine if you live in an environment that doesn't experience that much in the way of extreme cold and, most importantly, has an extraordinarily reliable grid. Like in the world where nuclear power is 90% of how we get electricity, I'd be all for heat pumps because you know that when you need it the most, nuclear power is going to be there. However, with the combination of heat pumps plus renewables, it is programmed in that the, the point where you need it the most, it's not going to be there. In cold snaps, there's not much in the way of sun. The wind usually doesn't blow as hard in the winter as it does in the summer, but you have peak demand at the exact time where these intermittent renewable solutions to climate change won't be there to perform. And so if you have a natural gas furnace, and you have a steady supply of electricity, you know that when it's minus 20 out, because I live in the northern part of the Midwest and we experience pretty severe winters, 
I don't lay up at night worrying about whether my home is going to freeze and the water pipes are going to burst and whether I have to move my family to a hotel or huddle around with blankets because the, the you know the, the the main source of heating our home has failed us. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need my furnace in the summer. And look, when the electricity goes out in the summer and it's hot, it's very uncomfortable. And in some parts of the country, it can be deadly for some small portion of the population. But if you're in northern Ontario and you lose heat, you immediately are in a life-threatening situation. Mm-hmm. It's a dangerous thing. Uh, people die from exposure to the elements in, in the cold far more often than they do in, in more tropical climates. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly on that topic, you recently wrote a piece entitled There She Blows, right? Going through the the merits of wind energy. And staying on this topic of, let's say, grid intermittency, why do most electricity grids with a high share of wind power invariably find themselves passing on higher costs to consumers? Well, because the what we mean by intermittency is sometimes it works very well and sometimes it doesn't work at all, and it can be difficult to predict that. And the actual operation of a modern electricity grid requires very, very tight load matching. Mm-hmm. You have to perfectly match anticipated demand in the next few seconds and minutes with supply. And when you have to make room for a low entropy, high intermittency form of, of energy like wind, what it really means is you have to stop producing power from the subset of your generation capacity that is both reliable and can be toggled on and off. So there is an array of what are known as natural gas peaking plants that exist to help balance the load when wind goes away, but can shut off when there's too much wind so that they can make room for this wind energy. It's the same with solar, of course, but at least with solar, you know for sure there's not gonna be any at night. (laughs) And so um, wind in fact is better than solar in this regard in the sense that it has roughly twice its capacity factor, Mm -hmm. but the cost of having to keep, maintain and pay for basically an entire second grid that is capable of achieving peak power production to meet demand when these intermittent sources of electricity are not performing is why Ultimately, everywhere in the world, Germany, the Northeast, California, where you introduce, Australia, where you introduce a significant amount of intermittency, you necessarily introduce a significant amount of excess expense and a concurrent decrease in reliability. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it's just a fact. And, and one of the big scandals, one of the big frauds, I would use the word fraud, is this concept of levelized cost of electricity which is used to hammer home the point that wind and solar are the cheapest forms of energy available on the market today, which to the uneducated listener means, wow, the only reason why we're not doing this must be because those dirty evil oil companies are, are polluting our politics and stopping us from achieving this, this you know, uh, self-perpetuating nirvana. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing could be further from the truth, of course. Levelized cost of electricity completely ignores the fact that there's a grid that must receive this energy. And it just assumes that they get to count all of their production at variable cost and all of the other auxiliary extra costs that come with having to deal with intermittency do not get booked against the renewable generating power that actually produces that intermittency. And, and we say in the piece, you know, um, there she blows, which is actually a piece about whales and it's more a piece about how the government is bending over backwards to forgive an industry uh, or to absolve an industry of any possible wrongdoing when they would be doing the opposite for the traditional fossil fuels and and nuclear power industry. Mm -hmm. But if wind was truly the world's cheapest form of energy available today, three things would be true. The industry would not require massive subsidies for its proliferation. Mm -hmm. Um, Even with government support, the wind value chain does not create economic value for most of its stakeholders. That would not be true if it were the cheapest form of energy. And finally, Um, as we just mentioned, electricity grids with a high share of wind power would find themselves being the cheapest providers of electricity when in fact, everywhere you look, where you have a large market penetration of wind and solar, you see higher costs. Mm -hmm. Those three things can't be, they're not consistent with wind being the cheapest form of energy. And that's because when people say wind is cheap, knowingly or unknowingly, they're quoting levelized cost of electricity 
um, not incremental cost to the consumer that necessarily results from the introduction of such energy sources. Do you think that if if and or when we get you know grid scale batteries to be able to harness and and store that that form of electricity that that will greatly that that it will make wind and solar a much better source of power when it's actually needed well you're basically asking me if the following impossible miracle occurred could we justify using more wind energy and i would say given the premise sure but we wrote a piece last month called um, mission impossible where we walked through the sheer volume of metals needed to make batteries a thing for the transportation sector let alone transportation and grid storage mm -hmm. um, and it's just simply impossible and so yes um if like if energy were free we could make polyethylene from co2 Lots of things are possible if, if you know, serious immovable constraints are suddenly removed um, at the wave of a wand. Um, if there was an infinite amount of cheap grid storage available, we could power our societies however we chose. Mm -hmm. Such infinite grid storage capacity is not only not available, but provably impossible to achieve. Um, the very same organizations uh, insisting that we mandate both the introduction of intermittent energy and the use of, of battery materials for electrification and for grid storage are the same organizations that are opposing the development of the the permitting of new mines necessary to get the materials needed to actually execute the task. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we wrote a piece about a, a lithium deposit that was discovered in Maine. And in Maine, it is basically impossible to get a new mine sited. And so um, while we're sure that many people in Maine um, are all for um, you know, electric vehicles, um, they're the same people um, who would be against the development of the lithium deposit, which just happens to sit 10 miles from a, um, from a very fine ski resort. And so um, ultimately, we're not very serious uh, about this because uh, when push comes to shove, we don't approve doing the hard work necessary to make these things happen, and uh, and so it won't. And and the piece that we wrote just for your listeners, um, where we talked about this amazing lithium deposit that was discovered in Maine that will never get developed, is a piece we wrote in September called "Transition to Nowhere," because if you're not going to get serious about mining the lithium, the nickel, the cobalt, and the copper that are needed to execute the envision transition, it is impossible that that transition will happen. So let's just accept that it's not going to happen then, because it won't. And so to your original question, it is mathematically impossible to develop sufficient grid storage to make the acceptance of highly intermittent sources like wind and solar the dominant way in which we produce electricity today. It just is. In fact, I saw a statistic somewhere, I might be wrong, something like the grand total of all of the battery uh, backup installations in the U.S. could back up the grid for a grand total of eight minutes in a complete grid down situation. Um, a true effective storage medium needs to be able to back up for hours or days because sometimes the wind doesn't blow and every night the sun doesn't shine and so yeah you know if if it if it, if it could happen by some miracle of course it would validate wind and solar it can't happen we're not big on we're, we're not long miracles around here yeah and it's it's just as simple as understanding the resources actually needed not even taking into account the nimby syndrome as as you've said it before on the show, not yeah. in my backyard of, of producing any of these resources and minerals. 100%. Yeah, exactly right. And that, again, the physics of it is impossible, mm -hmm. let alone the sudden U-turn it would take on the part of environmentalists to actually go. And by the way, like mining is a big deal. It is destructive to the environment. You have to move a lot of rock. Um, you have to use a lot of toxic chemicals. You have a lot of waste. You have, um, you know, um, tailings ponds that you need to settle for decades in order to get the heavy toxic minerals out of them. Like there are no, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And if you ignore the negative trade-offs and only focus on, on the good stuff, you're going to make terrible decisions. Mm -hmm. So on the other side of, let's say, intermittency, you mentioned Diablo Canyon earlier, which is a, a nuclear power plant in California. And just kind of pulling from 
a previous article here, with approximately 20% of the state's base load power being generated by the plant, you would think this was a no-brainer as long as it can be done safely. However, this doesn't seem to be the case. So what is the rest of the story here? And why is is the Diablo Canyon plant seemingly kind of back and forth in its license to operate? Sure. So we wrote a piece in early February called Nuclear Waste, where we dove into this story. And, uh, and again, this is a piece where we gave Gavin Newsom credit for working to save Diablo Canyon, which, as you mentioned, is the last remaining nuclear power facility um, in California, it produces 10% of the state's overall electricity and 20% of its base load power. And Gavin Newsom and the leaders in California know that if that plant was allowed to shut down in 2025, as it was planned to be, it would be a catastrophe for the state. The grid would collapse. Um, and so they worked with the legislature, spent significant political capital to get that decision reversed and to extend its life. In, in reality, though, what has transpired is um, in the U.S. at the federal level, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is deeply opposed to the development of nuclear power, has worked tirelessly over decades to stunt the industry's growth, to say no to every project, to oppose both the development of new nuclear power and, frankly, in this case, um, the extension of existing facilities, which is the biggest no-brainer energy investment we can make. And most people and many of our readers were completely unaware of just how captured the NRC is by the progressive environmental movement. And um, despite President Biden's strong support for the project, Gavin Newsom's obvious strong support for the project, the NRC came out and said, yeah, no, um, they need to reapply. We're not going to make this easy. Um, and in fact, their decision to send the project back to um, the state um, grid operator to uh, basically start the permitting process over risks having the plan actually shut down in 2025, despite near unanimous perfectly bipartisan support for it. And um, and as we said in the piece, you know, ultimately it's it's high time we had a conversation about whether we need to literally dissolve the NRC and start over because they are not performing their role. There's 3,000 people that work there. What are they doing? All they do is say no to everything. We at Doomberg could handle the NRC's job and not miss a beat on our cadence of publication because all we do is just say no all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Why do we need 3,000 people to kill the nuclear power industry. Um, and so that was a piece um, that opened a lot of people's eyes to just how corrupt and how captured the federal regulatory agency charged with overseeing the nuclear power sector is mm -hmm. and what a barrier they would be to a true renaissance of nuclear power, which is what we actually need if we actually care about producing energy with minimal carbon emissions, mm -hmm. um, which clearly is not the objective. The objective is to reduce the amount of energy the average person has to create a high standard of living for themselves and their family. And the NRC is the poster child for government corruption and bureaucratic malaise that needs to be wiped off the board if we're going to get serious about saving the environment. The, the NRC or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is tasked, according to their website, tasked with ensuring the safe use of radioactive materials for beneficial civilian purposes while protecting people and the environment. So according to their actions, Doomberg, what seems to be the safe level of use for radioactive materials? Uh, we would say in the piece, um, the, the, the first part of their mission, the beneficial use has been completely ignored. And they only focus on the second half, which is, quote, um, you know, the safe use of it uh, and protecting people in the environment. Um, beneficial civilian purposes were always deeply junior in priority to this bureaucracy. And history has shown that no benefit is great enough to offset even the most infinitesimal and imaginary risks concocted by this most bloated bureaucracy. Um, and, and this is all done, of course, with the knowing aid of the environmental radicals who work there. Um, and as we say in the piece, some problems are too big to fix. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's time to eliminate the NRC as a federal agency and start over. In our view, yeah. If it's not if it's not serving a purpose and it's not not achieving its goals, then what is the point of having it there? Well, if you go to their website, the logo and the motto doesn't include beneficial. <laughs> the word beneficial it literally is just U.S. NRC. United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'm looking at the webpage right now. Mm -hmm. Under it, it says protecting people in the environment. Mm -hmm. And then right there on the homepage, protecting people in the environment. Where is the fact that the radioactive materials for beneficial civilian purposes is also part of their mission? It's gone. 
It's been disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so if there are no benefits and only costs, the correct answer is always no. No amount of benefit will offset any incremental, minor, manageable trade-off that we might decide as a society is worth doing. Mm -hmm. We should, for example, like if you're so opposed to fossil fuels, is handling nuclear waste that big of a trade-off to make? Of course it's not. There are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And in the eyes of the NRC, there are no benefits, only downsides. And so they just say no to everything. And we don't need 3,000 people to do that. If we're just going to say no to everything, let's accept no as an answer and dissolve the organization. Mm -hmm. it's, it's outrageous. You you mentioned the, the, the concept of CO2 emissions. And it seems to be that they're that's always the focus of energy, energy consumption, energy production, everything. And it it really seems like there's two sides to that argument. One side says that CO2 is good for plants and good for the, the greening of the earth. And the other side says that there should be no CO2 emissions from human sources. So is the carbon argument here the, the main argument or are we missing the real point again by focusing on this one metric? Well, I would say that it's fine if we have decided collectively that minimizing carbon emissions is something that we should aspire to do. But the thing that's missing from that equation is not whether CO2 emissions are beneficial or harmful. It's what the maximum standard of living we can generate for our total population and how efficiently we can distribute that standard of living divided by the amount of carbon emissions we're willing to have. That's the ratio that needs to be optimized. And so um, you literally cannot have a high standard of living without wasting a lot of energy. How much standard of living do we want to generate for our people? Um, and then how can we do so in a way that we have collectively decided is important, which is to minimize the number of carbon emissions. Now, the fundamental argument about whether human uh, carbon emissions are going to catastrophically destroy the planet in ways that mandate that we proactively put an end to it um, is still an open debate in many people's eyes. I don't, I don't believe in the phrase settled science as a scientist, um, but that's not one that we even feel the need to um, engage in because ultimately we'll give it to you as an axiom. But you cannot minimize carbon emissions without necessarily impacting standard of living. And so let's find the trade-off. What level of harm on people's ability to provide for their family to achieve various aspects of the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Are you personally willing to sacrifice in order to achieve a reduction in carbon emissions? And by the way, if that is your guiding equation, nuclear power is the only answer. It is because of its enormous energy density, more than capable of providing an awful lot of what we need today with almost no carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. None after it's up and running, basically. Um, and so the very same people who are opposed to development of fossil fuels um, are simultaneously opposed to nuclear power, uh, which tells us they're deeply unserious about the problem. And it's not actually the problem they're trying to solve. They actually don't want a high standard of living for a lot of people. They would rather there be a lot less people. And they would rather that the people that exist live as humble and as basic and as simple a life as possible. That's just undeniable. It is the undeniable mathematical consequence of an implementation of their policy. And they should have the courage to run on that platform. Hey, vote for me. There should be a lot less of you. And the ones that survive don't deserve to live at the standard that I expect for myself. Go ahead and mm -hmm. run on that platform. Mm -hmm. Let's see how you do. They don't have the courage to, which is why they manipulate and why they propagandize and 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 why they um, obfuscate and, and infiltrate organizations like the NRC to um, do their bidding in secret. Um, but it, it's actually what's happening. If you are anti-energy, you are by definition anti-human. Mm -hmm. How much energy are we going to produce and share um, with the population? How are we going to produce it? And how can we do so with the minimum impact on the planet? Those are all legitimate questions. Um, but the Malthusian streak in the environmental movement means that these people do not want that, but they, they can't say it out loud because it is a dead loser politically. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that they're just not actually understanding the problem correctly and they're just seeing it through this this paradigm of one one side good the other side bad and don't understand the downstream consequences of what they're actually promoting and propagating so this is a great point and i should be clear on this the vast majority of people who believe those things are victims of propaganda 
they are not the purveyors of it. Mm -hmm. The true, you know, dastardly characters in this drama are the ones that know what they're doing and do it anyway and try to hide their true motivations from the public they're deceiving. Um, to the vast majority of people who spend way less time on this topic than you or I, um, fossil fuels bad, nuclear bad, solar wind good. And the reason why we can't have it is because um, evil monopolists are imposing their will via dirty politics and, and campaign funds. Um, this is, of course, there's enough of that that's true. The oil industry has, uh, it's not like it's an unblemished history of, of appropriate behavior. If you look past the past couple of decades, they've done their share of harm to themselves. But by and large, um, that's a bunch of nonsense. And, and it is so pervasive. The propaganda war has been so thoroughly won by the environmental movement that it is almost impossible to penetrate because it runs so orthogonal to what most people believe must be true based on what they've been told that um, it's a really uphill struggle for people of, that are pro-nuclear power, for example, or, or the natural gas industry, which is undeniably better than coal when it comes to its utility and its neg and relatively modest impact on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, but it is what it is. That's the that's the way the pieces are played. You got to pay the play the pieces on the board. Um, that's how we've carved out um, our audience on Duberg by trying to to show the full trade offs and the cost benefit analysis without ignoring the cost of the benefits. And even in that piece on wind, no, uh, there she blows. Um, we we took pains to say how wind was better than solar in some regards, and at least the wind blows at night sometimes. And and the energy intensity of the materials needed to make a wind turbine are far less than what's needed to make a solar panel. Um, so we presented both sides and, and we're, we try to be fair in, in everything that we do, but that's unfortunately in very short supply in, in modern discourse. Doomberg, you, you don't only touch on, or, or you guys don't only touch on energy and all the topics that we've talked about so far. You also talk about, about finance. You've covered the fiasco that is AMC here. And also one of the other ideas that we recently saw play out, let's say in the past six months was the crypto meltdown here. It seems to have cleaned, cleansed some of the space of the bad actors and programs. FTX obviously comes to mind, but with coming regulation to the space in the US, does this start to limit outside firms that you think want to do business with US customers? Well, look, let's, let's be honest. The US government is interested in US dollar hegemony and um, the U.S. Treasury wants line of sight into every single transaction in the world. And to the extent that um, pseudo-anonymous um, blockchains circumvented the government's ability to observe what was going on, they were going to be opposed to it. Um, I am sympathetic to much of the intellectual case for a, a Bitcoin, for example. I think I would separate Bitcoin from crypto, and crypto was largely a giant Ponzi scheme, as we're starting to see. Um, and we're seeing a, a concerted effort to choke off the entire crypto industry from the U.S. dollar payment rails. And I believe they will be successful and it won't be over until Tether is resolved, which is something we've been saying for a very long time. Um, and so it's an ongoing effort um, to make the crypto universe unbankable, which is the, the, um, the main tool that the U.S. government has as they regulate the banks and Wall Street firms and anybody who is basically reliant on, you know, following the law and and using the U.S. dollar as their primary medium of exchange, which is the vast majority of businesses, both in the U.S. and frankly, in a, in a lot of places around the world. And um, the U.S. government has decided in the aftermath of FTX, which we had predicted, um, many have predicted, but, you know, our, I believe our third, the third piece we ever wrote was crypto carnage coming. And it involved the profile of this Sam Bankman fried who we were amazed to see he was on CNBC in his pajamas. And uh, we had never heard of him before. And, and we said to ourselves, he's probably a billionaire. It turned out that was true. Um, but it just it couldn't, it was inconceivable to us that tens of billions of dollars could be flung around the world with no anti-money laundering, nor your customer protections, that the US government would tolerate this indefinitely. And it seems like it took the collapse of FTX and the significant amount of shareholder losses uh, on the retail side of things that have given the, um, the SEC and the US Treasury and 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 various other you know um, government agencies the cover they need to crush uh, crypto and I believe this is an ongoing operation. I if I had fiat currency in the crypto universe, I'd be looking to get it out. You you mentioned the 
that tether needs to be resolved. And and you kind of wrote a, a piece introducing the idea of counterfeiting U.S. dollars, and then introduced the idea that the stable coins in the space almost do that. So how how do you see that as as possible? So we wrote a piece called Circling Tether, and the two main sort of conclusions from that piece is one of the big stable coins, Circle, uh, USDC, operated by Circle, um, is provably backed by U.S. Treasuries and cash, ring fenced in the traditionally regulated banking system of the U.S. Um, BlackRock is, you know, the the gatekeeper of their treasury holdings. Their cash is deposited at FDIC insured banks. Um, if you think that a USDC is unbacked um, after all of that, um, uh, you're probably a little too skeptical. Tether, on the other hand, has worked for the better part of several years to obfuscate their holdings, to resist a full audit. Um, it's unclear who does their banking. And um, the counterfeiting analogy, and again, we weren't saying that it happened, but we we're saying how it could happen, um, basically goes like this. Tether invents US dollar equivalents of whole cloth, um, uses those newly minted tethers, which are basically a proxy for US dollars in the crypto world. And they buy some Bitcoin. And then they post that Bitcoin at the payment off rails to get fiat currency as a consequence of it. And, and in the piece, um, we told the story of a sort of a small time counterfeiter who, um, who, who got, you know, several years in jail for printing, I, I believe it was, you know, 467,000 us dollars and tether 41 at, months, right? Yeah. 41 months in jail for 467 grand. And look, we'd be the first to say like, don't take a color printer and try to print hundred dollar bills and pass them off because the secret service will find you and we'll put you in jail. Uh, the very same society has, has allowed Tether to manifest tens of billions of dollars of U.S. dollar equivalent in the crypto world with essentially no oversight whatsoever. And that blows our mind. Um, we're not there to say that the, the person um, who's been put in prison for counterfeiting deserves to be free. We just like, I believe his name was Cardona. Um, Victor Cardona, yeah. Yeah. Um, but instead, like, how about some, you know, equal application of the law here? Um, and and I know because I have relatives um, that don't live in the U.S. that sometimes I will wire the money because of a medical emergency or a gift or you want to support a family member. The amount of hoops that I personally have to jump through to wire five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to a relative is amazing. And and you do not get the feeling, by the way, when you run through that gauntlet, that this is your money, right? It's very clear that this is money that the U.S. government has decreed you are currently allowed to gift to a, a relative. But if they wanted to stop you from doing it, they had every authority to do so. And yet, billions of dollars are flinging around in a, in a crypto world without any oversight whatsoever. It boggles the mind, you know, and so as a person who aspires to follow the law, it is just an amazing contrast to observe. It's really stunning. Mm -hmm. And um, and I do think that the collapse of FTX will historically be viewed as the turning point where all of this nonsense was rolled up. And um, and that would be the end of the great crypto boom. It's, it's kind of interesting that you bring up the the point of it it not really seeming like your money. I went to to buy something the other day and I had to get a certified check and I had to tell the bank exactly what it was for and where it was going before I could get my money in the form of a check to be able to go buy what I needed to buy. So, you know, it, exactly as you're saying, the the idea that it's your money is kind of ironic sometimes when you see what you have to jump through to be able to use use it the way you want to. And look, let's be clear. We are not supportive of that policy. It should be your money. It's none of the government's business what you're doing with your money. Uh, we wrote a piece in uh, December called Crossing the Rubicoin, um, where we quoted um, sort of a conservative think tank making the case that money is not actually a public good. Um, this, this, is, this is a fallacy that we've allowed government to assume that they can control our lives through the control of money. Um, and I want to be fair, I just looked, uh, looked it up. It's the Cato Institute, of course, uh, this libertarian think tank that advocates for a limited role in government in, in domestic and foreign affairs as well as a, a strong protection of, of civil liberties. Um, and we believe, unfortunately, that the, the crypto collapse 
will be used as cover to roll out central bank digital currencies, which, as we argued in that piece, um, freedom is incompatible with with CBDCs. And the CBC, CBDCs, if we allow them to be rolled out, will be sort of the end of, of privacy in the most important way in which it matters, which is how you uh, decide to transact in the economy, which political parties you decide to donate to, how much beer you buy in a given week, um, you know, how much gasoline you purchase. Uh, gee, Tom, your carbon footprint's a little high this week. We're going to go ahead and not allow you to purchase um, but three more gallons of gasoline because we know you need to get to working back, but your elective use of gasoline for recreational purposes has been postponed for 10 days. Yeah. Um, when when I say that, people just roll their eyes and assume that, oh, that's far-fetched and you know, that's a conspiracy that's theory. That's the reason you're called Doomberg. <laughs> well, but uh, also I believe it to be true. Like this mm -hmm. is this is the, the you know, Ben Hunt, who's a fantastic content creator over at Epsilon Theory, wrote a great piece, I believe, in called In Praise of Bitcoin with an exclamation point at the end of it, or In Praise of Bitcoin without it. I forget exactly. Um, and he he describes, as I was talking about earlier, the eye of Soren, which is what the U.S. Treasury aspires to be. It wants to be the all-seeing eye of all aspects of of the economy and um last i checked this was not uh in the constitution um but just because we're pointing out this is the most likely outcome doesn't necessarily mean we support it mm -hmm. but for crypto from the beginning we always assumed that when push came to shove and when things got out of control the authorities would shut off the payment rails and you can own all of the crypto tokens you want but you're not going to be able to transact with them in the regular economy it's going to be blacklisted and your history of having partaken in such indulgences will be a, a, a stain on your on your central bank digital currency scorecard um, and along with how many bullets you buy or whether you purchased a firearm recently or whether you bought tobacco products or a little too much um, you know spiced rum this week uh, Tom uh, mm -hmm. it, this is coming um, to control money is to control the population and to control the population is the ultimate form of dictatorship and so we're very mixed on this like it was very clear from the beginning that crypto would be rolled up um that doesn't mean that we're super thrilled about it well doomberg on that terrible terrible <laughs> endpoint um i i think we've we've touched quite a few topics here today is there anything else that you 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 think you can think of that you'd like to add before we do wrap up i just want to add how much i appreciate the uh the invite big fans of your show you have a really engaged audience it's always a real pleasure for us to come and really appreciate your production quality and the professionalism and, and the caliber of the conversation we have. And so always thrilled to be a guest on your show. Uh, invite us back anytime. I would be the first to say yes and come back and really enjoyed it. And thank you for the opportunity. You can find all of our work at doomberg.substack.com. We are 100% subscriber supported. We publish six to eight pieces a month. We try to be provocative. We try to be funny. We try to teach a little bit as well. And if you enjoyed this podcast and you want to see more, you can head over to doomberg.substack.com. Thanks again, Tom. Great pleasure. Thank you, Doomberg. I appreciate those kind words. Um, professionalism is really the never, never more pertinent than than right now. And I, I do my best, and I appreciate that you guys do your best as well to to be professional. And as you say, not professional journalists, but being professional as, as professional as you can be at journalism. Right? How how did you say that? Yeah, we are not professional journalists, but we aspire to be professional in our journalism. And um, and in a world where distributed, you know, distributed sources of information and entertainment are all the rage, uh, we're trying to do our part to be as professional as possible while also fulfilling our mandate. And I, I know that you guys are the same. You know, you would never put out something that you knew to be false, uh, etc. And so, uh, again, I really enjoyed it and looking forward to doing it again. Appreciate it, Doomberg. And of course, your guys' Twitter handle is at Doomberg T. Doomberg, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.